So now I have the privilege of introducing our keynote presentation. <clears throat> so we spent the entire morning talking about Silicon Valley as a region. Uh, what I'd like to do is broaden our scope and talk about how Silicon Valley fits into the big picture of our nation and our dealings with our national leaders. And we wanted to do this in a very particular way. <clears throat> we have a frenzied election coming up. We have a capital that always seems to be stuck in gridlock. So we wanted to stage an extremely frank, no holds bar conversation to talk about the dealings of Washington, to talk about what's happening in Washington. Is there any way out of partisan paralysis? <clears throat> Is there a better way to handle our nation's business? Can Washington and Silicon Valley come together to team to solve some of our nation's most challenging problems? Now to tackle these questions, we need two players from Washington. Uh, we need one from each side of the, of the aisle, and we wanted them to have a couple things, a first-rate analytical mind and an expansive way of thinking. We also wanted them to be out of office so they could uh, give us kind of the, the no-holds-barred, tell-it-all approach so we get to hear what they're really thinking. <clears throat> so we were absolutely delighted when Newt Gingrich accepted the offer um, and accepted our invitation to, to join us. You all know Newt, right? Everyone knows Newt. Um, he was Speaker of the House back in the 1990s and a real firebrand out of the state of Georgia. <clears throat> he came to national prominence uh, as a principal architect of the contract with America. And this was uh, what led his party to victory in 1994. And this was important because it was the first time that Republicans had the House in over 40 years. As Speaker, Mr. Gingrich was feisty strident, and a disruptor. And we all love disruptors here in Silicon Valley. Under his leadership, Congress did several things. They passed a package of welfare reforms. They enacted the first balanced budget in a generation. And they made dramatic tax cuts. In 2012, Speaker Gingrich was a candidate for the President of the United States. It's particularly timely. Uh, he was the last Republican candidate to win the primary in South Carolina, uh, and he also took his home state of Georgia. <clears throat> Today, he is a prominent commentator in the media. He's a big thinker who generates bold ideas. He also works with politicians of every stripe, and we're so glad he's accepted our invitation today. Speaker Gingrich, welcome to the State of the Valley. All right, so, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so we needed to pair Speaker Gingrich uh, with a prominent Democrat, of course. It also needed to be someone rooted in the Bay Area so we could, we could bring this discussion all the way back home. That's why we were so delighted when Congressman George Miller accepted our invitation. He's represented the, the region in Congress for nearly 40 years. And he just left the House last year, so his perspective is very fresh. People considered Mr. Miller to be one of the most powerful Democrats in the House, and he's a tireless champion of progressive causes. He worked to craft some of the most important legislation in recent history and what's impressive is he did it with leaders on both sides of the, of the aisle, right, both parties. Uh, for example, he was a principal player on No Child Left Behind, which was the legacy of George W. Bush. But he was also helped shape the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. In other words, he's ideally suited for this conversation. So we're very fortunate to have him on the stage today. I'd like to work, welcome Congressman George Miller. Okay, and finally, we need someone to referee this conversation. It needed to be someone neutral, neutral third party, someone astute, uh, someone with a gift for engaging prominent people in a dialogue. 
And our search very naturally led us to a journalist here in San Francisco. She's the editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Chronicle and someone I consider to be a pillar of our region. Um, additionally, she's also a very warm and interesting human being. Uh, so I would like to welcome Audrey Cooper to join us on stage. All right, so Audrey, I place uh, this important conversation in your very good hands. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having us here and thank you gentlemen for joining us. I, I have to give a little bit of background. I was supposed to this weekend interview Caitlyn Jenner on stage. Um, Fortunately, that fell through, but I hope you don't mind. I just am going to use the same questions. So, <laughs> so let's start talking about the Kardashians. Now, <laughs> you look very concerned. <laughs> um, I, I think it's probably best. Let's start with we're here at the State of the Valley. Um, obviously, that entails a lot of things, not the least of which is economic uncertainty in Asia, uh, whether or not we're in a tech bubble here. So... Briefly, let's. What is the state of the valley in your opinion? We'll start with you. Start with me. I think it's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm not sure you want me commenting on the state of the valley economically and the rest of that. But if I look at the uh, the index that the joint venture put out on the on the uh, of the valley, uh, it's obviously exciting. It's dynamic. And every time I try to drive to the airport, I remember how much growth there's been down here. So it all works out. Uh, but I think that that uh, clearly. Uh, the, the Valley has really led the nation in so many ways in terms of coming out of the, uh, the, the deep recessions that we were in, the dislocations that we had, uh, and it's, it's clear that it, it, it's, for the most part, again, I'm speaking at a distance, uh, uh, sort of hitting on all cylinders in, 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 all, in all the right succession. And I also uh, was very interested in the extent to which the, uh, the index and the report indicated that this isn't so for everybody in the valley and there are tensions and there are there are areas where families and individuals are are getting squeezed by the rising prosperity in the valley uh in terms of housing and 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 the rest of it uh and i think that's a very important acknowledgement of it but uh, uh i would have to say in in all the time in the congress we bragged on the valley all of the time i mean this this has just been an incredible incredible cauldron of, 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 of innovation and forward thinking and forward leaning, all of the terms that people want to use. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's constantly surprising the world uh, with, its, uh, with its products and its processes uh, that are developed here. And it, it clearly is, uh, uh, we accept the bragging rights with uh, no conditions at that point. Former speaker, maybe you can pull the lens back a little. What do you think about what's going on economically in the world and how that trickles down nationwide and, and also here in Silicon Valley? Yeah, although I, I do want to say I wasn't particularly concerned if you wanted to start with the Kardashians <laughs> yeah. uh, because I think they actually explain two of the major candidates. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, I have I, to I, ask, I, in what way? <laughs> Gosh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, um, first of all, in terms of the daily deniability pattern of social media, uh, Trump is the perfect Kardashian candidate. Uh, he gets up in the morning, he tweets for a while, he calls into Fox and Friends, he does a little Facebook, he knows that none of it will matter because you won't remember by Wednesday what he said on Monday, and his job is to simply totally dominate the space so you don't know who the other candidates were because they're all operating in a pre-Kardashian world where you actually are supposed to think and be organized and do things in a structured manner, uh, and they can't, you can't compete with the speed. Uh, on the Democratic side... So true. On, on, on the Democratic side, Secretary Clinton's great problem is Secretary Clinton. Uh, and she fits, you may remember there was a moment where Prince uh, kicked uh, Kim Kardashian off stage because she couldn't dance. I'm so impressed that you know that. And, uh, <laughs> well, I have to be honest, Van Jones told me one afternoon okay. we talking about this. Because I was making the point she can't dance. Being old, I was talking about the fact that her husband is Fred Astaire. And he keeps looking for Ginger Rogers, and Jones had no idea what that was all about. But he said, no, no, what you really want to use is Prince and Kim Kardashian. Uh, and, 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 and so her problem is, at, at the level you, when you run for the presidency, you have to have some spark, which in some way, and the spark's very different for different people. 
but you have to be able to feel the audience. If you ever watch Bill Clinton in a room, and I know George has had this experience many times, Bill Clinton could come into this room and interact with every single one of you with such intensity that all of you would go home thinking that he was your personal friend and that you were stunned. And if he was up here giving a speech, he would speak to each one of you personally. And, and he'd speak a little more often to the girls, but still, the basic <laughs> premise would be the same. Hillary can't do that. So you have Kardashian influence in both the Republican and Democratic races. This is, this is mother said, Billy and I don't leave a room until everybody loves us. It's a long <laughs> night sometimes. <laughs> okay, and I do want to try to get back on track. It's okay. <laughs> no, I forgot where I was. So, so <laughs> Asia, I was talking about okay. Asia. So <laughs> now I want to ask you about Manolos and Louboutins and everything. Um, but, well, let's talk about social media. I mean, obviously it was born out of here. Uh, people are arguably, voters are more exposed to information about politics and policy than ever before. But yet, we find ourselves with an electorate that seems to, as you mentioned, have a very fleeting memory about things. Do you think, former congressman, that people, that voters are not as smart as they used to be, or not as engaged? And what role do you put social media in with that? Well, I would say it's fairly early in the season to decide whether how much they're engaged and, and you know, going to Iowa and New Hampshire, uh, we'll see. That's, that's sort of told them that the, the race is on, and we'll see as it migrates across the country, and many more people will be engaged. Obviously, a huge number of people, a huge number of people are engaged with Bernie Sanders. Uh, as there are with, with Hillary Clinton, uh, as there apparently now is with, with Donald Trump and, and, and the others. Uh, and this is a very, you know, what you got to love about American politics, every campaign year, you know, is, is different. And we'll see how this, uh, how this plays out. I mean, I think uh, you can say the problem with Hillary Clinton is Hillary Clinton. The fact of the matter is she brings a significant, significant uh, uh, assets to this, uh, to this race, knowledge, experience, and the rest of that. And the idea, as we've seen so many times, you know, today, everything's coming up roses. Two days ago, everything was, was dying. And so you have to take the ebbs and flows. The question is, where, where, where is the American public getting their information and how much are they paying attention? Is social media broadening that, that, that uh, engagement? I think it is. But is it, is it also deepening that engagement to, to get a better understanding of the issues and the consequences and what's at stake and who are the other actors? It's one thing to say you're going to bomb somewhere in the Middle East, ISIS or somebody else. It's another to understand what the ramifications of that are. And what does that mean as, for us as a nation? What's that mean to us as, in terms of, of, of terror and all of the rest of that? And this is also the time of sort of the lowest civic engagement, civic understanding, knowledge of history that we've experienced in this country among young people and, and among a fair number of middle-aged people at the same time. You know, that just, it wasn't a priority in the uh, school system as much as the Congress sometimes. We had these civic education programs we were trying to get, to get rolling in the schools at different time, and I don't know if we pay a price for that or not, and I don't know that social media, uh, you know, well, I do know, it doesn't cut you an accurate picture every moment of the time that you're engaged with it. And you know, we, we, we see people having to go back and clean up uh, quite often. So uh, this, this, I think, you know, will be a very interesting test because clearly it's, social media is much more mature than it was in the last cycle. And it'll be very interesting to see as, as much as, as you know, uh, President Obama drove this in his campaign and surprised uh, his opponents with this and surprised the pundits with the level of engagement uh, that's now true on both sides and with, with the various campaigns. So we'll, you know, be interested to see how it plays out. I don't have, a, I don't have a, an end story here yet. Do you think that it's part of the anti-establishment attraction that it's so easy to put this out on social media and get people to say, yeah, 140 characters, I agree I with everything you know, I, say. I don't know that it's so much anti-establishment as it is, makes the establishment irrelevant. I mean, George may remember this because he came a little bit before I did, but just before he, his class came in 74, they used to have a hierarchical structure in the Congress that was real. 
and that, that they had what they called the minnows and the whales. And the whales were a half dozen really big guys who made big decisions, and the minnows were all the little folks who got to run around and not do much, but they could make speeches. And in Halberstam's The Powers That Be, he has this brilliant chapter on Rayburn blocking television from covering the house. Because Rayburn understood that the minute you brought television into the house floor, you began to weaken the ability of the leadership to control things. And starting, I think, really with, with George's class coming in, which was a reform class out of Watergate in Vietnam, you began to open the house up. O'Neill allowed uh, C-SPAN to come in. Uh, one of those accidents of history, I arrived in January, C-SPAN arrived in April. And I immediately figured out, you could walk across the street, start talking on an empty house floor, and have 250,000 people watching you. <laughs> And I, you know, I was Some a college us. teacher, I thought, and, and you could talk for an hour. I mean, so I got five minutes longer than my lectures. I mean, I thought this was like hog's heaven. You know, all of my colleagues are going, what are you, nuts? Why are you talking to an empty room? And I say, how far would you fly to talk to 500 people? And they say, well, you go back home. And I say, fine, I'm talking to 250,000, and I'm walking across the street. And that was the beginning of a whole profound shift in power where being noisy was actually equal to being important. And you couldn't tell which was yeah. which anymore. There is, there is a progression here. This, it's interesting, be, since we're both sitting here, this is very unusual. The, <laughs> I, was, I was part of the Watergate babies, uh, Vietnam Watergate, financing the campaigns, corruption, Nixon administration was drilled in, in, into that campaign. When we got to Congress and we realized that some of these Southern chairmen who had been there forever were absolute... Uh, dictators in their committees, uh, even to the extent whether they would tell you when your committee was meeting because they didn't want you in the room. When they told Ron Dellums, the first black on armed services, and Pat Schroeder, the first woman on armed services, they would have to share a seat because there's no room for them. We said, uh, we didn't come here to do this. And so we voted down four major big time national chairmen in the Democratic Party and the majority. Newt came to Congress a couple years later and Rightfully or wrongfully, he looked around and he said, the way this is sort of operating is we're going to be a permanent minority forever. Why? Because our establishment gets 30% of everything and they're happy with their 30% and we're going to be a minority forever. And that's when he decided he would take, we got rid of chairman, but the chairman were still powerful. He looked at his leaders and said, if you're not going to, you know, if you're not going to fight harder for our principles and just take home your earmarks, then he started trouble. And so there's been, there's been, this, there's been this progression. And so I think I, I correct to say that when you became speaker, you also understood the power of the chairman and you then weakened it. And when Nancy Pelosi became speaker, she also weakened it because she could see that they could stop legislative efforts cold. Forget who's speaker. You know, there's a, so, there's a conspiracy out there among the chairs, the bulls, we call them, you call them whales. Uh, and you can get to today if you all have enough time. It won't be more than two or three hours before we can yeah. explain it to you. But, but, but let me, so if you think of so, C-SPAN as a social media, because it, because it was enabled people without any editing to see what was going on. The next phase, of course, is the rise of the internet. And, and here's the thing to recognize. Without the modern internet, and this is something the Valley can decide later if it's good or bad. Without the modern internet, you don't get Sanders. It's his extraordinary ability to raise $27 uh, multiplied by, the, the, I think now, the largest number, larger number of donors than Obama. That is allowing him to then go back, because once you get him, you can now go back again and again, you know, and they're still under the, the legal limit. Second, without the social media, you probably don't get Trump because it was somehow the social media that Trump understood, and I really do think the Kardashian model with Trump is really accurate. I mean, this is the guy who has, remember, wrote his first bestseller in the mid-1980s, was on the cover of Time Magazine in 1989, uh, had the number one TV show in The Apprentice, took over and ran Miss Universe. I mean, this is a guy who has thought about the public, has thought about marketing. A, he, he's the only candidate who speaks at the fourth grade level. And, you know, all of you are laughing because you think it's a sign he's stupid. No, this guy's a Wharton graduate who's worth five, at least $5 billion if you take the Forbes version or $10 billion if you take his version. But either way, it's real money. <laughs> Even in the Valley, $5 billion net is real money. And, and so 
he speaks at the fourth grade level because he's learned marketing golf courses, casinos, hotels, TV shows, you know, and, and, and ties, by the way. Uh, he at one time had the best selling tie in the United States. Uh, he's learned that the fourth grade level means you get everybody. The PhDs sort of understand it if they pay any attention, and people who only got out of eighth grade understand it. Uh, but he does it in social media. So it's, it's both the rise of the, the, the news shows like Fox and MSNBC, and the rise of social media, including YouTube. And then, and then you have both Sanders and, and Trump, who I would argue don't so much represent anti-establishment as they represent the irrelevancy of the establishment, because if it, you're not an establishment if you can't impose your will. And I think both parties are about to discover that the American people are bigger than the people that used to think they were the establishment. Well, that leads me to one of my questions for you, Congressman, about, about Bernie Sanders. You know, the attraction is he goes out, universal health care for all, these big statements that I think any pragmatist would know are going to be almost impossible to actually get if he were elected. Do you think that these sound bites that are perpetuated and allowed to persist and encouraged by social media are actually doing a disservice to the people who believe in him. Oh, I don't, I don't think they do a disservice. I think, I think the questions you see being raised, is this realistic? Does he really understand it? How, he, how is he going to pay for it? That's the establishment fighting back, as Newt was saying, in, in many ways. Stop. You don't have a pay for. Well, they just spent, what, $17 trillion over the next 10 years with no pay for's for tax extenders and, and uh, EITC and, and a whole range of things, much of which are very good and some of which isn't so good. So, but now they're going to say to him, you better bring your pay force to the debate. No, he's not. He's going to bring the idea that nobody in America should be without health insurance. I was a single payer when I first ran. I had, my platform was get out of Vietnam and single payer health care. When it came to the crunch on the Affordable Care Act, I said, so we can get 20, 30 million more people covered with health care if we do this and we can win this, or I can hold out for single payer and we can start over next year. I'll take the 30 million people because I've read the testimonies, I've visited with those families that have never had health insurance. It's not like they couldn't get some sort of coverage. They've never had access to it other than an emergency basis. So Sanders, but he's, remember, he's rallying his troops. He's gathering the people on social media. I mean, the speaker is absolutely right. But, but now all of a sudden, the, the establishment wants to say, well, here's all the rules. If he survives the process down the road, those rules are going to become more and more to the forefront because deficit will be back on the table. The architecture of this will be back on the table. But that's not where we are now. We're, we're kind of in a preliminary high school rally here. You know, and I, I don't really mean that in a derogatory sense. It's just that everybody has a scenario how everybody else can win or everybody else will lose because only they can win. I mean, so it's early in this game. It's early. I don't know if this feels like John McCain and George McGovern or whether this feels, feels more like Reagan. I mean, I don't know where the outsider, you know, and the timing with the political cycle. Obviously, social media has sped all of that up. And so we'll see. I, I think there's a key part of this which does relate back to what the Valley has done. Uh, one of the books that most shaped my career is, is a book by Alvin and Heidi Toffler called The Third Wave, which mm -hmm. came out in the late 70s, and which basically argues that we're now in an, in an information revolution that argues that the first wave is agriculture, the second wave is industry, the third wave is information. And it, it's, it's, it's such a valuable way of getting you to start thinking, you know, if that's really true, I, I use as an example of government's incompetence because it's now an obsolete structure that you can go most, well, just to test. How many of you have gotten money out of an ATM outside the United States? Raise your hand, okay, almost all of you, right? So you go to an anonymous machine, put in a plastic card, the machine lights up with six or eight languages, you pick one of the ones you're really good at, <clears throat> you punch in a four number code, it reaches out 7,600 miles across five international borders, finds your bank, verifies how much money you have, gives you the local currency that you have asked for in the amount you asked for. You have no idea what the exchange rate is, but you, you believe it is better than the hotel. Okay? <laughs> this entire process takes 11 seconds. It currently takes 177 days to move a veteran's records from the Defense Department to the VA. And this is the valley which has shattered all that, but it hasn't leaked into government yet because the bureaucracies essentially have, have rejected the modern world and said, no, they don't want to learn any of this stuff. So, so here's what I think 
both Sanders and Trump in their own unique way represent. They're not having the same conversation as everybody else. So Sanders can, with a straight face, say, look, if we tax all the billionaires and all the giant banks, we have enough money. Now, you may have 17 economists sit, sit around Brookings and have a seminar and explain why that's technically untrue. But if you're a normal American, you're going, I like that, that sounds good. Let, let's tax those banks in New York and those billionaires, and then I get my, my free health insurance. I'm, I'm for it, or I get my free education, okay? So the same thing is, is what Trump is doing. I mean, people have not gotten into this yet, and, and maybe George is right, maybe they will, but I have a hunch they're not going to. When, when he says, I'm gonna charge Mexico for the wall, <laughs> you know. You get that money I, in 11 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> you get that money in 11 seconds, right? <laughs> You know, the, fir the first reaction by a... Crowdfunding, that's called, right? Isn't that's, that right. that's right. But, but you know, the, the first reaction by a sophisticated member of the establishment would be, that would violate the World Trade Organization. <laughs> to which Trump would go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because the World Trade Organization is bad for America. So in a sense, you have these two very radical critiques. They're different, they come from a different angle, but they're equally radical, and so they're having totally coherent conversations inside alternative universes, and here in the middle you have the Republican and Democratic elites who are just totally befuddled. Well, elites, uh, they, or it, you could also say it's the rest of the country that's not on the yeah, ends of the political And the fact cycle. of the matter is, they have an audience because that rest of the country, I don't care your political stripe, and I'm not too concerned about your economic level or your educational attainment. There's a lot of unhappiness in this country with the functioning of government. I would say it's not just the federal government, it's the Flint, Michigans of the world. It's, it's, it's demonstrated the lack of, of having a, a metro system that can meet the, what we expected to be the growth in the, in the state of California, however you want to design that. It's out there and government is not functioning terribly well. And you can all r rattle off one, two, three, four, five examples of that. This isn't about partisanship, it's, but it's continuing to grow and the fact of the matter is, People are deeply concerned about this. And so there is an audience for a guy, that, you know, and what happens historically, you're the historian, there's a tendency to, to turn to a strong person. And Trump has a very strong voice, and he's gonna bomb this, he's gonna stop this, he's gonna build that, I'm the best builder in the world, none of these people have ever built anything. That'll take you a distance. At some point, there'll, there'll be another exam, because that's what, the, that's what the electorate does. It raises the bars as you get closer to election day. And we'll see how that goes. But the idea that there isn't an audience for, for whether it's Bernie Sanders, I, I would say for all of the candidates, right? <laughs> Some of them, they're proving that. There's only 7% that's their audience. But, uh, but I think if you're a politician, you dismiss all of this, you're making a huge mistake, and I don't think you're talking to your constituents whichever district you come from. I think it's true across the board. Do you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned both the ATM and alluded to wealth inequality, which of course, you know, Silicon Valley is one of the greatest generators of wealth this world has ever seen. It also has generated incredible inequality in this community and elsewhere, which I think you both would probably agree is feeding some of this fervor around both of the candidates what role do you think government has to pay attention to wealth inequality, and is it solvable? Well, I think the question is, do you want to hold on to a democracy? Uh, we have a lot of countries around the world where relatively few people uh, in the Middle East, elsewhere, in China even, are, are fabulously wealthy and getting, it's accelerating uh, in terms of, of their wealth, and, and you have huge instability. Uh, and you can show, you know, the Arab Spring, you could, you know, the, uh, in, the, in those countries, the, the army, the, 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 the elected people, the appointed people, the, the strong men, they were, they were taking it and raking it in all off the top. And so you can go that way. And uh, uh, I don't, I, I think you have to think about how this is done. And I think, and it's, and it's a broad, you know, it's, it's a broad cross section. You know, I'm, I think in California, we all favor zoning, but we, can see, we see how zoning and environmental laws and other things can keep you from ever developing housing for low-income people or for people with disabilities or people you don't want in your neighborhood. So where do they go to get housed? Who's gonna provide the housing? And you start to see the multiplier effect. Where do you get your ch check cash if you have a check? What do you pay to get that money? Where do you bank? 
Where do you buy your car? Where did you get your insurance? And pretty soon you can start to see the cumulative impact of, 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 of being a low income individual who may be busting their ass at two and a half jobs to keep, keep afloat. I spent a lot of time on the minimum wage. I spent a lot of time talking to minimum wage workers. These people work really hard. And I think that's finally what America discovered. And we saw that, I think all of this is linear from Occupy Wall Street, but we saw that when, when, they, when they supported the fast food workers. And if you look at every major corporation, not I shouldn't say every, but if you look at some of the very surprising American corporations who interface with the public every day in terms of customers, walk-in customers, not necessarily online, whether that's Walmart or whether that's Yum or whether that's uh, McDonald's, they're now changing the wages, they're changing, aiding for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for education, they're, they're starting for the first time to say, you can adjust your schedule in case of emergencies. If, 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 we can if we, Audrey and I can trade off and there's no harm to the business and I can take my child to the doctor, you can do that now. That used to be forbidden. I think there's a reaction to, to, to uh, gridlock in Washington. These campaigns are now taking place in Seattle and San Francisco and the East Bay. Three red states raised the minimum wage this last year. And for the restaurant association, it says they cannot survive in the restaurant business if they can't pay 1968 wages. I bet they wish they would have taken Barack Obama's $10.50 an hour wage. That looks cheap in California today. But that's what, I mean, that's where you get the disparity. But even a $15 minimum wage in Silicon Valley isn't going to get to no. the heart of wealth and equality. Well, no. So, uh, Speaker, do no, you, you always have to say, except in Silicon Valley. Except, well, <laughs> except in all of Northern California, almost. Do you think that there's anything the government can do immediately sure. to help wealth inequality? Well, look, I, I think you've got to look at two totally different strategies. One is distribution. That's where you mandate a particular wage or you do something. Uh, and you try to make sure people, and I think probably we have to rethink the entire process of how we pay a wide range of welfare benefits to find a way to integrate them into work, almost something which Moynihan had first proposed and worked for Nixon in the late 1960s. Because <clears throat> we've in many ways created caps that block people from working and caps that block people from rising. But I also think you gotta, you gotta look, and, and George, uh, I'm delighted to mention Flint as an example. It, to talk about inequality in America and not talk about the degree to which, in particular places, government is the enemy of opportunity. I mean, you go to Detroit, where 92% of the kids last year failed their reading exam, 92%. Now, this, this should be a national scandal. This, this should be an emergency the size of 9-11. I mean, you can't have a healthy country in which one of your major cities has maybe 50% illiteracy rate, and then you want to talk about inequality? You can't give them enough money to get to equality. And so you've got to actually rethink and restructure the whole process. I, I was with Mayor Reardon years ago when a friend of his tried to put a factory into Los Angeles to help him and called him after a year and said, we can't work our way through the city bureaucracy in order to be able to build the factory, in order to hire people. It is impossible. And you see this in almost every major city. So part of it is government has become a major inhibitor of opportunity, and you have to have a profound change in education. Because what, what Silicon Valley is doing is creating a world in which if you can't read and write, and you can't do math, and you can't improve your life, you have no future except taking a handout. And yet we have big cities. In, in, uh, in, in Baltimore, we spend $137,000 for annually for each eighth grader who passes the eighth grade math exam. Because only 13% of them pass the exam, and it's the third most expensive big city school in the country. So, I mean, these are really profound changes that you need. We need to de-license. I mean, it turned out the other week when we had a big snowstorm in the east, New Jersey finally repealed licensing for shoveling snow. Well, if, if, you know, if you get out of prison and you want to go do manual labor, uh, in, in, in Nevada it takes, I believe, it's 890 days in order to become a barber. My father now, used to say, if a guy doesn't give you a good haircut and you walk around town, pretty soon he'll be out of business. Right. <laughs> but, but what's happened is every interest group has figured out how to block competition, and the result is if you're poor and you're trying to get to the first rung of the ladder, 
You got to pay so much. It was four hundred and fifty dollars for an eighteen-month license in New Jersey. I, 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 I really want to go into how big government caused Flint, Michigan, because I, I, I feel like that's something we can't just let it go unsaid. Do you, did you want to say? No, I, 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 no. My contention is government that wasn't paying attention, that ignored it, or made a conscious decision, perhaps, that this. That, these people could live with this water and we'll, we'll, we'll do elsewhere for the rest of it. When you find out that they're buying bottled water for the city employees and other people or kids are getting poisoned, there's something definitely wrong in that system from, from human values to everything else. But my point is at every level you, you're engaging this and I think we have to rethink that. And you know, uh, I, I was sat through a demonstration by one of the, one of the companies here, one of the big data companies uh, a couple of years ago, and I watched them track medical fraud, $60 billion a, a, a year. I watched them track that. They're struggling to get a contract with HHS. Same, same firm, apparently was able to do it for the Marines, but the rest of the Pentagon couldn't describe the system on incoming fire so you could protect your soldiers. I mean, there's, there's you know, uh, and I think, it's, listen, I'm not, a, I'm not an anti-big government guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused But I, I, I like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of old-fashioned in the sense that, yeah, I like a dollar's worth for a dollar, okay? I just, I like performance. And I think, I think, ROI. That's, yes, and I, and that, so that, that's the point. I'm saying that there's an audience out there and you're finding it on the right and the left. And in, in America, when you find it on the right and the left, you better recalibrate everything you were thinking before the opening of the season. Well, I, it, it, and that's a perfect segue. I really want to talk about ROI in government. That's something everyone in this room is obsessed about in their own companies. How do we get the best return for the money that we're putting in it? Uh, you mentioned earlier that just the basic tech in government is, I mean, to call it antiquated, I think, would be generous in most School district systems don't talk to each other. Police department systems don't talk to each other. Uh, most epically, when the Affordable Care Act website went online, I think we all know what happened to that. Everybody in Silicon Valley thought, what? They can't even get WordPress to work right? Um, so what role do the people in this room and the people in Silicon Valley have in helping those basic government uh, inefficiencies and Will that actually lead us to better functioning government? Well, let me first of all say the president came very close to the right breakthrough. I, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Breakout that talks about these kind of ideas. And the president got very close to that when he had the press conference after the website had melted down. And he said, people asked me why we could do it in the campaign and we couldn't do it here. And the truth is the campaign doesn't have to follow federal regulations. Now, there was a logical next paragraph which is, therefore, I'm proposing that we scrap all of these federal regulations so we could actually become a modern country. But he stopped right at, you know, this is why I couldn't do it, as opposed to, therefore, let's do this. So two quick examples, one of which may, and, and by the way, I, I am for very strong, very lean government. I always tell my right-wing friends, you want to control the border, that's a strong government. You want to be safe worldwide, that's a strong government. You want to have a currency that's stable, that's a strong government. So it's not that you're, the question is, is the bigness effectiveness, which it was in World War II, or is the bigness just slop because people are hanging around because they have for three generations? So let's take the example of modern, I use an iPad and an iPhone. Uh, Calculate the speed and competence of an iPad and an iPhone versus carbon paper with a manual typewriter. The Pentagon was built for 31,000 people to manage World War II with carbon paper and manual typewriters. Now, at a minimum, our goal should be to turn the Pentagon into a triangle. Take 40% of the Pentagon and turn it into a museum or use it to house other government agencies, saving the rent. But it is an absurdity to have anything less than change on that scale. One of the problems is, this is true in the VA where they're, they're, they're just having an embarrassingly painful time, until you're prepared to radically overhaul, and this is true at every level, until you're prepared to radically overhaul the civil service system so you can reward the competent and get rid of the incompetent, you cannot make the system move. And I'll just give you two things that this valley could do. Pick a couple of places in the valley and make them models the rest of the country can visit. Don't, don't come and preach to us in Washington about how to change the whole system because it's too hard. But if you were to take two or three towns or two or three counties or two or three school boards and say, we're going to apply every inventive concept in this valley, and I'll give you just one simple example. Every teacher should take attendance every hour 
on a smartphone and should report it in real time so you know precisely who's in class every day, all day. That one step will change all sorts of information flow patterns that will make things different. But if you took two or three places in the valley and you invested the resources and you invested the inventors and the entrepreneurs, you could create models worth studying that the rest of the country and for that matter the rest of the world could come and say, ah, this is what the future will look like. So we have about three minutes left. I want to ask the big question that everybody really wants to know your answers to. What happens in November? <laughs> you think we got this far in politics by answering that question today? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Do you look at this cast of characters and say, gosh, I really should have one, one, oh, mir- one of the great miracles of the modern world. We will have an election. <laughs> we will pick a president of whichever party or third party if Bloomfield, if Bloomberg runs and spends enough money because he's worth about eight times as much as Trump. So he could spend about $5 billion. And, and then it would be interesting to see what a $5 billion, talk about redistributing wealth, a $5 billion presidential campaign would be like. Um, and next year we will have an inaugural. And my prediction is that whoever is elected will initially have more bipartisan cooperation. That's the question. Yeah. That's, the That's the question. If, if, if this new president goes into his or her term with the same attitudes in Congress and the same behavior in Congress, then we have a really serious, we barely survived this in terms of just being here today uh, with this divisiveness and these, this hardened positions where there's no, no cross channel. I w- I'm encouraged as, as Speaker Boehner was leaving, the discussions that he and, and Speaker Pelo- uh, Leader Pelosi had to to, uh, 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 to to keep the government from shutting down. Uh, I'm encouraged that those meetings are more frequent now about the future, but I'm also deeply disturbed that you still have sort of the Hastert rule uh, where a small minority of the majority can keep anything from moving forward. If that's going to be honored, we'll have a lot of trouble. This world's moving much too fast for us to be bogged down in this. And and at some point, members of Congress have got to decide that they're for the best interest of the country, not for their partisanship, not for the, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, Tip O'Neill and and Ronald Reagan figured out how to modify Social Security to to improve it. You did welfare reform with with Clinton on how to improve it and change the circumstances and help people become gainfully employed in in, in our society and support support their families. I did education with Teddy Kennedy, John Boehner, and Judd Gregg. That's that's rocks of granite from if you want to talk about uh, hard conservatism. And the fact of the matter is we moved it forward. It's not that you get everything you want, but you have a responsibility to go in the room and see if something can be worked out. You don't have to sell your values. You don't have to agree to it. You can check your gun, go out, and come in another day. But if this system can't get back to working where they respect the views of others, you don't try to impugn their integrity on a daily basis, or you don't impugn the integrity of the administration on a daily basis, then I would say this country is in one hell of a lot of trouble if these changes can't come. I'm a, I think this, Ms. Uh, Speaker, I think Speaker Gingrich is also a cycles of history p- person. I believe this cycle's already started to turn, and I hope that it will, because we can't go through another eight-year term, assuming the, the president's re-elected uh, with this, with the, you know, the other day the Wall Street Journal ran an article and suggested that the, the gridlock in Congress is shaving 2% off the growth of the GDP. I don't know if that's accurate or not. We only grew at 2% maybe. So how the hell is this going to work out if we keep this up? And I think that's what the American people ought to be thinking about. And that goes, that goes to the elections from the top all the way through. Is how we, got, we, we can't afford this. This is, this is way, way, way too expensive politically, internationally, in every sense of the word. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we'll thank you. Thank you. Uh, Speaker Gingrich, Congressman Miller. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.